Okay, let's start. We yeah. Can we take those? Take yeah. Take them all. I mean, Adam always is still teaching to the last minute. I don't know where Tyler is right now. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I've got a, to begin with, I've got a copy of Being in Time lying on the desk. It must be something that someone left behind. Maybe it has a name in it. No, only Heidegger and Husserl's names are in it. It wasn't theirs. So, what a, well, I'll just leave it here. Somebody claims it. I wonder if it's marked up, if anybody's reading it. No, just a book. So, and let, let, are there any questions or problems? Everything seems to have gotten off to such a good start that it's hard to believe. It even got cooler today, just, just in time for the lecture. So I'm just going to go right back to talking about uh, what we're talking about. Uh, I think, I don't know how far I'm going to get today, but I think today will be relatively straightforward and easy. As I keep warning you, and you must have discovered if you've done the reading for this week, it gets extremely hard and complicated toward the end of the assignment. If I can get enough of the phenomena out on the table today, to then I can explain those abstract things. Heidegger's always understandable. Maybe I should just give you this principle for how to read it, as far as I can see, is what you, you go along reading Heidegger and it seems to be pointing to some phenomenon, but it's pretty hard and so forth. Then if you can get the phenomena that he's talking about, which is what we've been doing, like the phenomena, the simple phenomena of using equipment and how that works, then you can go back and understand the more weird things like the in order, the, the in order to's and towards witches and for the sake of witches, all of seem like too much jargon, they all map nicely out. That's what I'm going to do today on to the Heidegger. And then you go back and forth. Well, thanks to understanding the Heidegger, you can understand more precisely what the phenomenon is he's talking about. And the more you understand precisely what the phenomenon is, you can understand more and more clearly what he's saying. And he says in one place, I, d I wasn't expecting to make this speech, so I didn't look it up, but he says in one of his lecture courses, but the phenomena first, always the phenomena. That's the, the thing to remember with Heidegger. That's what makes him interesting and different and in an odd sense easier than anybody else. So here we go. We've done the phenomenon of all of the kinds of being already. And uh, that, uh, that is the two big, the three big kinds, the present at hand, ready to hand, and Dasein. Now we have to add a more shaky one, shaky only in the sense that Heidegger is not very clear about it himself, but it's very important, and it's always around in the book, but it doesn't get thematized very much, and that's the unready to hand, which, and then we have to talk about the, how they relate to each other, all these, all these various ways of being that we've been talking about. That's the main uh, project for today, or one more version, two more versions of the, of the project for today would be, and it's trying to give you the structure of worldhood, just what Wittgenstein says you couldn't do, you, that, that there is a structure in the, the hurly-burly of everyday activity, and he's going to find it. And another project, which I've mentioned, but is going to get more and more central over today and next time, and that is to destroy the distinction between subjects and objects and between <coughs> self and world so that if you understand Heidegger and the phenomena, you won't be able to even understand anymore what people were ever talking about where they, when they talked about, for instance, proofs of the existence of the external world because he's going to show there's no internal, no, no internal external distinction, no subject-object distinction, no self-world uh, distinction can stand up to a, to a uh, description of the phenomena that has freed itself from 2,000 years of tradition, get, making, making this distinction with all sorts of variations. Uh, and now, we'll just plunge in and do all those things. They'll take the next two lectures. Uh, so, starting with unreadiness to hand, that's where we were last time with the end. And it is... It really is a sort of a mess because he doesn't focus on it 
and he doesn't distinguish it clearly enough from the present to hand. He says a sentence which makes my hair stand on end on, uh, on the top of 103. The, there's a kind of presence at hand, he says, about ten lines down. The presence at hand of something that cannot be used is still not devoid of all readiness to hand whatsoever. Equipment which is present at hand in this way is still not just a thing which occurs. All that's true, but it's sort of weird to be trying to explain this special mode of being, which is unreadiness to hand, which is the way you experience things whenever they're either not only when they're not working, but when you're learning a new skill, when you're, as he says in a passage I'll read, when you're inspecting things and so forth. There's a whole mode of being which isn't transparent and withdrawn like the ready to hand, and it isn't uh, just in a context, deworlded way, sitting there with properties like the present at hand. And he should just say, and boy, oh boy, look at that, another mode of being the unready to hand, but he doesn't. He sort of tries to make it somehow a special feature of the present at hand. I mean, don't worry about that sentence. I mean, you can worry about it if you want to, but I don't recommend it. I think it's better to try to fix him in this case than to try to figure out what in the world he has in mind. We can see what he has in mind if you look at the bottom of 102, which is 73 in the sermon, when he talks about conspicuousness. I mean, that's the phenomenon. Conspicuousness presents the ready-to-hand equipment in a certain unreadiness to hand. That's the right thing to say. And, uh, then, and then we can begin to describe what it is like, this, this uh, unreadiness to hand. Uh, and you, then he describes three, three modes of disturbance where disturbance doesn't necessarily mean, as I used to think, breakdown or malfunction. Disturbance just means anything that, that stops the transparent, ongoing coping that, that uh, you normally just have. Ongoing is a, is a Dewey phrase, but it fits this perfectly. I mean, e everyday readiness to hand, when it's working, when it's withdrawn, is just going on and nothing interrupts it. Heidegger uses the same phrase somewhere, but I, as I say, every time I, I start saying things I wasn't going to say, I can't give you the pages. When I come across it again, I'll, I'll read it. But the main point is that there is a mode of experiencing equipment which isn't transparent, ongoing, absorbed coping, and it doesn't necessarily have to be breakdown either. But it is a hard word, hard to find a word for it. I call it disturbance only because something comes along which disturbs the ongoing, uh, unproblematic, skillful coping. And it could be, Heidegger has three kinds, conspicuousness, and then he also mentions, what is it, the, the, the obtrusiveness, and because I decided I only wanted to talk about conspicuousness, but now I'm talking about all three. Help me find the third one. What's obstinacy, right. These are sort of progressively dis holding up of what you're doing. Conspicuousness is the interesting one to me because that's the main one that you have a lot of the time and plays a big role. The other ones are when things are really breaking down and something is either not functioning at all or something is in the way of something else. I don't even want to talk about them. I'm happy to talk about conspicuousness and you can do the rest. Um, now, conspicuousness can occur when something isn't functioning as well as it should be. That is, you can see that best. It's sort of scattered all over being in time, and I'll just have to help you find it. On 409 is a very important place where he's talking about this. 409? So it says, let's see. Oh, yeah, that's a, a little a sort of throwaway phrase, but it's important. This is German 358. <coughs> it's important to see that it's not breakdown. He says, on the contrary, never mind what the contrary is, the tarrying, which is a funny word, but that means sort of 
coping with things, but not ongoingly. The tarrying that, re that results from a discontinuance, this is my translation, of one's manipulation. You better fix that, which is that because it's all wrong in, 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 in here, and you couldn't understand what it meant if you read it tarrying, which is discontinued when one manipulates. No, it's the, it, it's the tarrying that results, that, it, that, you, that you'll get held up, slowed up, from uh, the discontinuance of your ongoing manipulation. That can take the character of a more precise kind of circumspection, such as, now we get these positive ways of paying attention to what's going on that's not transparent, but is not a breakdown either, such as inspecting, checking up on what's been attained, or looking over the operations that are now at a standstill. But not as a, <coughs> excuse me, not as a standstill because anything broke down, but it's the end of the day, presumably. But, and you can add another important one, it seems to me, which is when you're learning some new skill. Then you've got to pay attention to, the, to what you're dealing with and how to deal with it. And that's conspicuousness. And it's not a breakdown or a malfunction. It's hard, not even really a disturbance. It's just a mode of being that you'd have to go, th you need some time. Yeah? Okay, that's when everything's at a standstill. At the end of the day, you pay attention. I mean, I think of that... Maybe you could, if you were a bartender that was really good at it and had done it a long time, all sort of with transparently. I mean, it's not clear that you have to pay much attention to collect all the glasses and polish them and put them back on the shelf. Uh, if you do, then I think you're just learning the, the, the skill and then not really a, a full-fledged coper yet. Anything else? Oh, okay, let's let me. So, so learning is another important one. Um, or having, and it's sort of like learning, dealing with a new piece of equipment. I mean, it's sort of a little different, but not much. I mean, you can be learning to ride a bicycle, or you could be dealing with a multi-gear bicycle when you only had been riding a non-gear bicycle. All that would be conspicuousness. And what's important, why it's important that this is a special, interesting way of being that Heidegger doesn't cash out enough is that what shows up then? I mean, if it, it can't be that nothing shows up, that would be withdrawn. That would be exactly what should happen if you're co really coping well. And it can't be that substance and property show up because that would mean that you'd sort of be given up altogether. That's what happens when you've lost something that you were trying to work with or the hammer can't be found or the something's in the way and you can't reach the hammer. How Heidegger has, those are the obstinacy. And what was the other one again? I keep forgetting. What? Abstrusiveness. Abstrusiveness. Now, but, it, but it can't, it, when, when th those are so, can be so far gone that you're just staring at things and looking at their properties, and then they're present at hand. But conspicuousness, particularly, the other ones can probably be like that too, but it doesn't matter. Conspicuousness must reveal things in its own unique way, not as invisible, so to speak, and not as substances or properties. And Heidegger knows that, and he mentions it, but way back on page 412. And most of the interesting things about all this happen on page 412, which since we're never going to get to the second part, Division 2 in this course, we better just look at that paragraph now. Hammering comes back. It comes back in a context which is not relevant right now, namely He's going to derive what, a theoretical attitude and what, you do, and what shows up in a theoretical attitude. But he's going to get there starting with coping and starting with something uh, that's conspicuous because it's not coping well. So it's a second paragraph on 412, which is 358 in the German. When we are using a tool circumspectively, we can say, for instance, that the hammer is too heavy or too light. Even the, what is utterance, I want to say, that, the, I mean, couldn't be, I mean, the proposition is irrelevant. I mean, even the utterance that the hammer is heavy can give expression to, the propositions don't give, exp 
expression, I don't think, but it doesn't matter for what we're doing. Even the utterance that the hammer is heavy can give expression to a concernful deliberation and signify that the hammering is not easy. I'm changing it a little. In other words, that it takes force to handle it, that it, that it will be hard to manipulate. Uh, okay, stop with that. What, what, do you, what that is, so what shows up? Namely, that the hammer is too heavy. For, and that's a very interesting something or other because it's not a property. A property of the hammer, like it was brown, it would have in any situation. It, you just It's lying around brown and you drop it onto the, to the people, the bushmen in, the, in the, the gods must be crazy and it's still brown and that's what properties are. They're p- permanently uh, uh, in here in substances, all of course relatively permanent. Substance can, can be disintegrated and you can paint them other colors, but that doesn't matter. Properties are these fixed features of substances. Well, what is too heavy? Well, Heidegger doesn't have a name for it, but I'm going to call it an aspect. An aspect is defined by being situational and relative to some task. So the hammer isn't just too heavy. It wouldn't be too heavy orbiting the Earth. Uh, it's too heavy for me, for this this job, or these kind of nails, or this kind of wood, and it's maybe, or maybe it's not always too heavy for me, but I'm tired. And uh, I, you can make up anything you want. The important thing is that too heavy is not a feature of the hammer. It's a feature of it's a something that that you that you can uh, say about the hammer in a context relevant to a use. And that's fascinating because that means that there's a whole area of something or others that the tradition has never had a name for and that you wouldn't be able to deal with in a predicate calculus because too heavy isn't a predicate. A predicate names a property. So, and 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 it it isn't a feature either because a feature names some uh, normally some detached, some isolable cue or something in, 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 in... cognitive psychology. It's an aspect is, a, is this funny holistic something or other. Uh, and Heidegger should have been happy to have discovered the importance of that because he's very interested in holism all the time. And this is one kind of holism, that things have properties which you can't define in isolation from the thing and from the situation. Uh, uh, yes? Well, I don't know. Well, I, what is a secondary property? Well, for example, if you're talking about color, it's a secondary property. Ah, oh, it, I see. Ah, now I got it. Yes, it doesn't, but, I, it, but it's interesting why. He's thinking, you're thinking, I believe. Yes, of course, color could be relative to me. Somebody, something with a different visual system wouldn't see the color. But, but in the everyday world, I mean, that's too far off scientific and not phenomenological enough. Color is definitely a property, uh, and it doesn't show itself, so to speak, as depending on your visual system. And so, so secondary properties, rightly named, I think, are still properties. They're properties which, in, from a theoretical point of view, uh, are not self-sufficient. But that's... We, we may turn out to be wrong about color, and, uh, but phenomenologically, it's going to just be a property anyway. Yeah? What's that? Oh, really? Oh, well, uh, let's do something about that. I'm glad you said it. I just don't, don't sound loud enough back there. Is that the problem? Okay, I'll sound louder if I could maybe. Uh, help, Dave. I, I can't. Okay, go ahead, Chris. Um, I was going to point out on page 101 that there's two paragraphs. He gives a vision. Wait a second. He wants to. Well, that's what I was trying to do, but he said, I need to move it down toward the middle. Well, let's let's see what we do here. I'm glad somebody spoke up. I don't. Okay, now. You think I. Am I louder now? Good enough? Okay. Um, Tell me if if it turns out not to be working for you. Now, go ahead. Yeah? Yeah.
property you think? Yeah, but that's wrong. But I mean, the, a wrong of Heidegger. No. <laughs> Wait a minute. I mean, that's bad. Okay, though, uh, well, that's only because he's used we, uh, this, we, the word aspect. I mean, but anyway, it's he's he may not want to call it an aspect because oh, this is on 101. I know I know he uses aspect in his, in his own way, and it's probably not going to work with my way. But and, and I'm not attached to aspect. I just don't have any other name for this. But let's see his use of aspect. I mean, his use of aspect. I'm, I'm not disagreeing. Chris, right? Curtis. Curtis I knew it was quite right. I'm, I'm, I'm disagreeing with Curtis only not about uh, what word to use. But let's worry about that. The kind of being that belongs to these entities is readiness to hand, but this character is not understood merely as a way of taking them, as if we were talking some aspect of the entities. Ah, yeah. In quotes, no, you notice. And what he means there is, if you use aspect that way, he's saying, well, you don't just uh, take present at hand entities and give them uh, functions and assign them functions. We're going to talk about that precisely next Tuesday. That's the issue he's got with Descartes and John Searle. And, uh, but it's not, it's not this. But I'm glad you brought it up because if that, and I don't know another better word, so I'm going to take the word away from him. He, it is not a technical term for him. It's just a little quote word. Well, I'm not convinced that that's, maybe. You think it's used as present at hand? So the I guess the question is, do you think he uses aspect in a revised way? No, I mean, I, he asked me, I don't think he uses aspect in, in a revised way, because I don't think aspect has any clear meaning. In the tradition, it's not, it's not a term that's got a present at hand meaning or, ready to, or an unready to hand meaning, and he doesn't bother to give it. I mean, that's my complaint. He doesn't have to. I mean, I don't care what word he uses, but he better find a word that the tradition hasn't taken over and made into a property or make up one. He's good at making up words. Why doesn't he make up one for, for the too heavy? Whatever the, but the, and the too heavy, you know, is all over the place. I mean, things are either are too bright and too hard and too easy, and, and, uh, and that's just a, a one subset of all the ways that things can become... Conspicuous, I think that's a good word, e and not just transparent, but go on coping, uh, go on functioning. That's that's the hammer being too heavy is just an example. Did I see a hand up there? Yeah, Tyler. Yes, that's exactly what Curtis is saying too. Yes, yeah, hi, but but. But does, is that a traditional use of the word aspect? I never came across the word aspect except in Wittgenstein, where it's in fact used in, in a Heidegger way, where when you have a Gestalt switch, he, he says that you can see the same uh, figure under two aspects. Uh, that's good. And I think Heidegger and Wittgenstein are on to something, but uh, Heidegger hasn't got a word for it, and Wittgenstein calls it aspect, and I think aspect is up for grabs. I don't think it's a traditional word for property. But we, let's not go any further in it. As long as you've got the phenomena, remember, back to the phenomena, and there's nothing mysterious about it. It's, and let's just agree so we understand each other in our papers or reading each other and so forth. We're going to call, we're going to take over the word aspect from Heidegger and use it to describe the situational characteristics of things. I'm just trying to avoid the word property. Uh, Characteristic may be, a, I just invented it, a blanket term that's going to cover aspects the way I'm using it and properties. They're both something that uh, a hammer can have. Uh, now, I didn't expect that to be such a big deal. I mean, it's, it, it is a big deal, but the name for it is not supposed to be a big deal. Um, it's a holistic something or other of a hammer or of anything that's, that's functioning, but not very well. 
or that you're learning to use, remember, I've got to go back over the big list again because I'm falling into the fact that the hammer happens to not be functioning very well in, the, in Heidegger's example. But if, if you were inspecting things, they would have aspects. I mean, the job was really well done or uh, sloppy. Those are aspects. I mean, given sloppy given what you expected and what you wanted and what the situation requires. If you were, what are the other list of things? Uh, if you were learning things, they could be too hard or too simple, or, uh, and so forth. Uh, whenever, it doesn't have to be something not working. Whenever you're in the unready-to-hand business, then you're in the aspect business. And I also think that, uh, that uh, there's some, and this is something just on the side for those who have had any husserl or surl. I think they're in the aspect business sometimes. I think that w when you get aspects, you get some... No, I don't want to talk about that. Sorry. If I do, it, it'll just confuse you and interrupt what I want to talk about. Um, so let's go on to the changeover to the present at hand, because we're on page 412, and that's where we should be staying and not wandering off. Because that brilliant paragraph, which I'll come back to again much later in the book when we get to science and theory. But we'll, let's just go on a little. Uh, the entity is... Uh, but this proposition, this utterance, the, the name of the hammer is too heavy, can also mean that the entity before us, which is already known circumspectively as a hammer, has a weight. That is to say, it has the property heaviness. So you see, he's got the word property right. He just doesn't have any name for which it, what, what, what the heaviness is. But, uh, he, and what has happened when you've made that switch over? It, well, you've now gotten to the point where you're describing it in a way that, you have a, that it's always got. It exerts a pressure on what lies beneath it, and it falls when that's removed. When this kind of talk is so understood, is no longer spoken within the horizon of awaiting and retaining of equipment, Never mind awaiting and retaining. That's technical division two talk. But in the horizon of using equipment, uh, an equipmental totality and its involvement relations, uh, then you're in, you're in the, the, the present at hand. And you can make one more switch over, just so you see the whole picture. You can, there are two kinds of present at hand. Heidegger knows there are. He sees the phenomena. He hasn't got a good name for them either. But there is, I want to, I'll name them. There's substance, and you already got to the substance when you've got an object that has the property of heaviness. But you can get it even more, uh, if that's already desituated, because it has it all anywhere. But you can then just totally deworld it. And Heidegger talks about how science deworlds things. That means take it out of all reference to us and to anything else. And then you could say, the hammer has mass, he goes on. Uh, we are looking at something with mass. You cite something that is suitable for the hammer, not as a tool, but a, but a corporeal thing. You see, you get to the corporeal thing subject to the law of gravity. That to talk circumspectively of too heavy or too light no longer has any meaning. I mean, in science, nothing is too heavy or too light. Electrons have a certain weight, but they're never too heavy or too light. They just have it in, the, in a de-worlded way. So the entity in itself, as we now encounter it, gives us nothing with relation to which it could be found too heavy or too light. We've switched over, as he says at the bottom of the page, changed over to, in fact, the scientific way of uh, thinking about things. Okay. Um, Now, come, now comes a much, I mean, that was supposed to be just easy to get out of the way. The interesting question arises, once you've made these, the, all these distinctions, you want to ask yourself, now we've got all the modes of being on the table. We just added the unready to hand mode of being. And I just caution you, Heidegger never calls the unready to hand a mode of being. That's me. I do it in my commentary un, unwittingly. I attribute it to Heidegger. But I've been beat on by various smart students and TAs who point out there isn't any place in being in time where Heidegger says that the unready to hand is a mode of being, but, he sh but I say, but he should. 
and he knows there is the phenomena, and it is a mode of being. He just hasn't said it. Okay, now, the interesting question is, once we've got all these modes of being, we want to understand something, and now we can put the ready to, unready to hand out of the story. And that's one reason why he never has focused on it. It's not the big deal issue that interests him. The big deal issue that interests him, that comes out of the tradition, is how to relate the present at hand, the traditional understanding of being of entities, to the ready to hand, the Heidegger understanding of the being of equipment, and ask the question, the ontological question, once, uh, which has a priority? The, the substances with their properties, uh, onto some kind, which, which is ontologically basic? The substances which the, with their properties, on, onto which you somehow have to add a function predicate now and then, or the whole world of, equi of, of functioning equipment? That's a big deal, hard, interesting question. Uh, which, in the Heidegger jargon, which he gets from Husserl and phenomenology, which founds which? And you want to say, come on, Heidegger, now you have to make up your mind and make an argument for which way. You obviously can't have it both ways. Uh, and the answer is, from Heidegger's point of view, as I understand it, I'm sort of constructing this a little clearer than it is here in, in Heidegger, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think Heidegger's answer is, it's a philosophical um, assumption or, or, or prejudice or something that you've got to settle this question as if there was only one kind of founding and you've got to decide which founds which in that kind. But I think Heidegger wants to say that there are two kinds of founding and they each found the other and there's and just stick to the phenomena again. What, what goes on? Well, he says that the present at hand underlies the ready to hand on 101. He says it is a rhetorical question, but I think he really believes it. Uh, he says, and this, is cru this crucial passage is, is all about this. So right after the aspect passage. And he's, uh, he's talking about the people who think that there are brute facts to talk like John Searle, and then we give them function properties. And he's saying that's not so. Uh, and now he's going to try to say, uh, he's going, to, he claims, oh, it's complicated, huh? Well, I'm going to just blurt it out, and then we'll read the passage. What I think he holds is that causally, the present at hand underlies and founds the ready to hand. He better hold that. What would that, that means that you can't just make anything into a hammer. You can't use ice or butter or pillows to hammer in nails. And that's because they've got the wrong causal properties. They're not suitable. Remember, suitable is one of the features. We didn't talk much about suitable, about equipment. We talked about what was appropriate according to the culture. And we talked about, what was the third one? We, we had three, finally. Suitable. Yeah. Uh-oh. Again. Yeah, okay, I talk louder. Is that better? Okay, well, good. To, to, to keep, me, keep me doing this. Uh, but what, what, are we do, what are we doing now? We've got, I just have to review. We said that to be equivalent, it had to be suitable. It had to be socially appropriate. And what? Yeah. What was the, I had a name for each of these things. It had to... It has to have, let me think, it has to be suitable. It has to have, a f it has to be, a p that's what he's saying too. It has to have a function, ah yeah, it has to have a function in the system of other equipment and it has to be socially recognized as have it, that being its appropriate function. Right. Now, wh why am I saying this? Because uh, that's, I, I'm trying to talk about the, the causal properties. The, and I, oh yeah, and the causal properties are what makes it suitable. That is, as I just said, you've got to have the right causal properties for hammering. So in a certain sense of founded, uh, which, which, he, which I think he would call underlies, uh, the, the uh, present at hand is going to underlie the ready to hand. But on the other hand, 
And that's the new idea. I mean, that's the old idea. I mean, that's what uh, everybody from Descartes to Searle would say. That's how it's founded. That Heidegger wants to say, but there's another kind of founding, which is what makes it intelligible as a such and such. And none of these causal properties make something intelligible as a hammer. So if you're asking what founds this intelligibility or what underlies the intelligibility, it's got to be its role in the world of coping Daseins. And that's fundamental and founding. So there are just two foundings. And I, as I put it, and I don't know if you brought the chart. I said to bring this chart of the modes of being of entities other than Dasein. I mean, I'm not going to read all these details. I, I said, how many don't have the chart? I was going to make more, but I didn't bring more because I'm not going to talk about it long and because I found some typographical and other little sort of mistakes on this one that make me want to fix it. Then I'll, pu then I'll put it back on the website in a better form. But in the, in the for the time being, it's good enough. And it is on the website. And you can find it and print it. But what all I want to say is you can, reading the, from the top down and the bottom up means the following on the left-hand column. So if you read it from the bottom up, never mind that bottom bottom, which is pseudo stuff that philosophers invent and Heidegger doesn't believe in. But if you, be, if you believe in the present at hand and no more, that's the theoretical stuff that uh, uh, you see isolable determinate properties. The hammer weighs 500 grams and the, it, it's all about the, there's a universe and that governs these theor theoretical elements. Then you read it from the bottom up and you try to account and, and period. And you say and these causal properties uh, underlie readiness to hand. They don't account for readiness to hand. That would be the, the, that's the mistake. That's what Searle and Descartes try to do. Heidegger thinks you can't use physical properties to account for meaningful relations as the, the readiness to hand. So you read it from the top down. That means that the most intelligible th uh, thing for us is equipment functioning and then, uh, on the basis of that, you know, the now we get the on the basis founding, which is different than physical causal founding. On the basis of that, you can make the, the unready to hand intelligible. And on the basis of that, you can say, well, and if you left out all the situational properties of the ready to hand and the unready to hand, what you'd have left is the, in, is the present at hand. So you derive its intelligibility. What it is to be present at hand is founded on what it is to be ready to hand and unready to hand and on their, it's be having a place in the world. And remember, Heidegger is quite clear about that. I keep quoting this phrase, the, the, the presence at hand depends on us, but the present at hand doesn't depend on, what's present at hand doesn't depend on us. So there's that stuff, what's present at hand, which doesn't depend on us, which founds the, the, the suitability of the hammer. And then there's the, under, the intelligibility of it the, and the being of it as being ready to hand or being present at hand. And that depends on us. And you can derive being present at hand as a more and more uh, attenuated uh, version of readiness to hand. I mean, uh, that's very mysterious, what I just said. And I'll, try, I'll say what I mean, but we'll, we'll have to go over it more when we get to the Descartes thing. Why do you have to derive it that way? Well, the punchline of the Descartes part is really, you cannot make sense of the present at hand uh, independent of I understanding that mode of being or that mode of intelligibility as being having a lot left out of the readiness to hand. And, what, and you, what you can't do is try to make sense of the ready to hand by adding something to the intelligibility of the present at hand. That's why the founding relation goes both ways. If the causal one goes up and the, uh, the intelligibility founding goes down, I think it's just important to say that because uh, sooner or later people get worried and confused about it. And this is sort of the answer to what he's saying on 101 as a question. 
and, and, and oh, well, more than a question. Let's go above, right, <coughs> a bit above 72 in the margin. 101, sorry, 101 in the English. I, it, where in the middle of that big paragraph, to lay bare what is just present at hand and no more, cognition must penetrate beyond what is ready to hand in our concern. Readiness to hand is the way in which entities, as they are in themselves, in quotes, just when they're being themselves, are defined ontologico categorially. Uh, that's always kind of funny that he would point to put, re remember he puts readiness to hand in category because it's not Dasein. Everything that isn't Dasein, which is existentials, comes under categories. I wouldn't, I don't like that. I think we need another word for it. But anyway, it doesn't matter for us. We'll just take it his way. And now somebody comes along, so to speak, like an interlocutor and says, yet only by reason of something present at hand is there anything ready to hand. And well, you think that's right? Yeah, I think that's right because that's the causal claim. If there wasn't anything that had any causal properties, there certainly wouldn't be any hammers or any other equipment. So that's not wrong. Uh, but now, does it follow, however, granting this thesis for the nonce, that readiness to hand is ontologically founded on the presence at hand? What's the answer? Does it follow? No, because ontologically founded has to do with intelligibility. So you can say, yes, the present, the, without the present at hand, there wouldn't be any ready to hand. But you also have to say that without our understanding of the being of the ready to hand, we couldn't make any sense of the being of the present at hand. Does that blow your minds? If so, I'm sorry. It's not really that hard. Uh, and uh, am, I, am I starting to talk to myself again? I mean, I, I drop back into... Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, good. Say so. I can see you looking worried from clear over here. So tell me what worries you. Well, this, this is too hard for now. Um, we have to debate this when we get to the reality chapter. It's really got to do with sort of what's, what is his view of nature. And here, he, when he talks about nature on 100, he's saying, well, there's lots of ways to understand nature. You can understand it as ready to hand when it's the wind in the windmill and the water in the, in the dam, or you can understand it as the sort of stuff the, uh, the, the, and you can understand it even as the romantics understand it as this overwhelming uh, uh, s uh, overwhelming something or other and the, so but, but it's so but what really you're really asking is but how in the world are we well, how do we understand the status of the entities that supposedly have the causal properties that account for the way the hammer works and that's like asking, how do we understand the status of electrons? And the first thing to say is, well, the electrons are intelligible, thanks to us. They're intelligible as present at hand, and they're intelligible as having whatever our theory says. And then there's the further question, and, what, and would there still be electrons if there wasn't any Dasein, if there'd never been any Dasein? Were there electrons coming out of the Big Bang? Well, science certainly says there were. And I'm going to talk about this but way later in the course. I think Heidegger completely agrees with science on this. I, I, Heidegger thinks there are two, but I think Tyler doesn't think that, and we'll have to debate it. Uh, the, uh, let me, there was one more, more way I was going to put it, just a second. I mean, why do I, why I, I just had one more thought about electrons, whether they were around all the time or not. Uh, 
Well, I can only just repeat. It, it, it's, I think that he thinks that the present at hand in some way underlies the ready to hand. I'll show you a passage where supporting that. And I can't think of any other way except causally. And I can't think of how it could do it causally if it were, wasn't that there were, in the jargon of the philosophy of science, natural kinds with causal properties. But that's, I was going to say, I'm not going to talk about it now. I'm just going to mention, I think I may have mentioned already, Heidegger was a uh, math, and si math and, and science major as an uh, undergraduate. And I really sort of, this is not an argument, but I think once you uh, were, I was too, you can't really ever believe that the, scientific, that the electrons out aren't out there with their mass and charge and spin, whether anybody's around or not. But that's not enough just to believe it uh, because you've been sort of conned into it. You have to have an argument, and I haven't given you an argument, and we won't get an argument until we get to the part on reality. But I'll show you a place where I think my way of looking at it glimmers through in the midst of such murkiness that I don't expect anybody to be blown away and believe it. Okay, where is it? Ah, it's the same passage where the unready to hand comes in that I've been talking uh, talked about at the beginning at the beginning of the today. Help, help. Where is it? Somebody has it in their notes, I'm sure. Where I, uh, where I, what, what? Prob well, I, I, yeah, I think that's right. No, but 103, that's close. Okay, now, the crucial sentence here um, is that it looks like, in some way, the present at hand has been underlying the ready to hand all along. It, so when he says, are we going to grant that for the nonce, I think he grants it. Then, then the question is how that happens. But here's what he says here about the underlying, which I think is important. Uh, I'm going right after unreadiness to hand at the top of 103. But this implies that what cannot be used just lies there. It show, if, if, there's a, if you're staring at it, just lies there. You're not using it. It shows itself as an equipmental thing which looks so-and-so. I mean, this, this thing, people call it a hammer. It's lying there. It's got a blob, and it's got a shank, and it's got a properties, and so forth. It, now, it, an experimental thing which looks so-and-so, and which, in its readiness to hand as looking that way, has constantly been present at hand, too. So what does that mean? I mean, that's some recognition that the, that the suitability of the hammer Makes, it has been there all along. It's just something that you aren't paying any attention to, and rightly so. That is, again, pure presence at hand announces itself in such equipment, but withdraws. That's a different sense of withdraw than when you're using it. But, but it withdraws to the readiness to hand of something which one concerns oneself. That is, you stop paying attention to the properties when you're using it, and so forth. Uh, and that's it. I mean, that's it for the time being. Put it on. Put it aside. If you want to write your second paper on Heidegg, whether Heidegg is a, a realist about science, it's a great subject. I struggled with it for years, and I think I understand it now. But it's it's not obvious by any means. In fact, almost all the commentaries you're going to read, if you look at if if, if you read other commentaries than mine, you're going to find even the great Bill Blattner, whom I admire immensely for having a very good grip on this thing. Is thinks that Heidegger is an idealist about the about science, but so that's now we got to go on and we'll get back to that someday. Uh, now we've got this, this talk about the structure of the world. We haven't really done that yet. I mean, we promised that we, he's Heidegger's going to do what Wittgenstein couldn't do, and we've got to overthrow the subject-object self-world distinction which we promised to do, but we haven't done it yet. And that's for the rest of today and all of Thursday. That's the job. And I'm going to read you something from the Metaphysical Foundations of Logic because it's so interesting how Heidegger says that he doesn't say doing Wittgenstein's job and finding the structure of the world is his job because that just hadn't occurred to him. But he does think it's his job to destroy the subject-object distinction. And he thinks that that distinction has been around forever. And now it's got to be fixed. Um, but first, that it's been around forever. This is on page 130. 
I, I used to think the subject-object distinction starts with Descartes, and it does in a way. He names subjects, he and he names objects instead of substances, and subjects instead of, I don't know, people or something. And he, he treats them as more self-sufficient. He has a lot of different properties. Heidegger's going to go into this in amount of detail, which I should warn you, don't worry about it. When I might forget to say this. Next week, when we get to the destruction of Descartes himself, so to speak, there's lots of act, the detailed discussion of what, a re, what race extensa is and what race cogitans is. Don't get bogged down in it. You don't have to know it to understand the, the, the refutation that he's going to give. But, but, but I now see that anyway, it, that he thinks that there was something like the subject-object distinction, more like the self-world distinction, was around already, and Descartes just sharpened it up. So on 130, he says, first full paragraph, 130, not of the high, uh, being in time, but of the metaphysical foundations of logic. Remember, the, the, I keep repeating this, just shows the two books that are like bookends around, uh, well, the three books that are casting light on being in time all the time, and which I put on the uh, recommended reading list, are the history of concept of time, which was written before being in time, the basic problems, which was the course Heidegger gave the year being in time was published, and then a year later, this course, which is, so the Heidegger's getting clearer and clearer about being in time. One more thing I should remember to say, I have, of course, put all the recommended reading in the Howison Philosophy Library. I never said that. That's important. I mean, you, you, you're welcome to buy it if you can afford it and, and, and want to have a lot of Heidegger around, which I certainly like to do. But you don't have to buy it. You can go read these passages that I'm talking about in the philosophy library, which is on the third floor of Moses. So here's what he says. It's remarkable that the problem addressed by this claim. Okay, and that's, let's start one sentence earlier. Being by is an existential. That being by is the thing that is badly translated being alongside the world. Being by with a by isn't much help either. That's being amidst. As an existential is, of course, itself a problem. It's a problem precisely because of the seeming self-evidence of the premise of a subject-object relation. That is, how are you in the world? Well, that's what we need to know. And, be, and it's an existential that you are somehow roughly at home in the world. And now he's going to try to talk about that. It's a remarkable problem. It's, it is remarkable that the problem addressed by this claim cannot be budged. It is, an, it is as old as philosophy and appears already in Parmenides. That's how wrong I used to be. The view developed early and easily in the pre-philosophical pre understanding of Dasein that the soul, thinking and representing, con and conscious, the soul, thinking and representing, and consciousness establishes a relation to objects, or put conversely, that being occurs before and lies opposite to thinking, seeing, and representing. This view. This understanding of Dasein persisted for a long time in a general and vague form, and then he says how it got worked out more in the medieval and more in Descartes and more in Kant. And then he says on 131, the, the, I said, so he doesn't, as I said, know that he's going to show that there is a structure to worldhood, but boy, does he know that he has to destroy this. It's more than just destroy Descartes. It's more than destroy Descartes to John Searle. It's something, it's very, very big. He says, one, at bottom of 131, still in the metaphysic foundations of logic, one of the main tasks of being in time is to bring this relation, that is subject-object kind of relation, radically to light in its primordial essence and to do so with full intent as the first characterization. And then he says, my essential intention is to first pose the problem and work it out in such a way that the, the, listen to this, that the essentials of the entire Western tradition will be concentrated in the simplicity of a basic problem. So he thinks that the whole philosophical tradition is sort of hangs on this, and he's going to refute it, and that's, that's, he knows what he's doing, and he's going to do a good job of it. 
And now, where are we? Let's see. Uh, and how is he going to do it? Well, he got him several moves. I said he already missed one of the moves. He could have done it partly by the holism of, of aspect, but he didn't make a deal out of that. But that's not a big deal one anyway. The big deal one we've already read is on 97, 68 in the German. I mean, now, we're, we're looking for ways in which he's going to show that this holism of world is that there is a holism to the world. It's all interdefined. And he's going to show that when you follow out that interdefining, it's going to destroy the distinction between self and world. That's the job. So first you have to see that it's interdefined, and that's on 97. We've read it once, but it's very important to him. And I don't know any place in these other books of the same period where he says it, although he certainly knows it's important. He says, equipment in accordance with its equipmentality always is in terms of its belonging to other equipment, inkstand, pen, ink, paper, blotting pad, table, lamp, and furniture, windows, doors, rooms. These things never show themselves proximally as they are. We encounter, and so forth and so forth. That is, there is, and then he says in another place, I didn't quote it and I don't think I can just open to it, there is no such thing as an equipment. That's the same, the same claim. If anybody knows right where that is, I would like to see it. Now, I, I'm on 97. Where are you on 97? Middle paragraph. Ah, taken strictly, first line of the first full paragraph on 97, 68 in the German. Funny, I haven't marked it. Taken strictly, there is no such thing as an equipment. That's the interdefiningness. But that's just the beginning. Now comes a whole job of showing how this whole equipment is related to us. and Well, first, how the whole equipment is related to each other, because all he just said is a bunch of names of table, chair, lamp, floor. How are they related to each other in this, in a holistic way? We see the phenomena that uh, you, that there's no such, you can't take them out from the whole complex, but how is that complex going to be defined? described, and then how is that complex going to be related to us? That's the big deal. I hope we get here there this hour, but if not, we can have it as an amazing uh, a hanger hanging on something. But let's see how far we can get. The way it's, these things are all related to each other, the, the lectern, the table, the floor, the books, all that, is that they have reference to each other. They have bearing on each other. The German, the thing that gets translated, assignments, on page 97. All his business of equipment has this way of bearing on or being assigned. It's just a name for what we've already been talking about. In German, it's Verweisungen. And, uh, it, and uh, I, he, the translator uses references, uh, or, and other people use assigned. So the, the question is, how are you going to describe the way that the lectern is related to, uh, to my book. Well, you could say that they're assigned to each other or that they refer to each other. Both of them seem very wrong. For refer seems to be too, too linguistic and assigned seems to be that somebody came along and assigned them. I would say they bear on each other. But you might even find a better way to say it. That you see what he's getting at. They all uh, relate to each other. He doesn't like relate because it's too general and abstract. They relate to each other, let's say, as equipment relates to its other equipment, and that is they, they bear on each other. Or sometimes he s says something that gets translated, they're involved with each other. That's pretty good. So the table, and that has its own strange quality when you think that the lectern is, uh, is, has an involvement with the book. It sounds too much like something Dasein might be having. And, and, but I think it'll, it, it, it'll do. But I still prefer my bearing. So the hammer, and now you're going to hear a lot about the way this equipment bears on other equipment. That, you see, all this has to be unpacked. It's not going to just, you're not going to believe it if you're a good philosopher just because he, sa he says it. He's got to show you. And in showing you the way this works, the whole of equipment, 
He's also doing, at the very same time, laying out the structure of the world, answering Wittgenstein. And he starts to tell you how all these interrelations work. So it turns out the hammer is for pounding in nails. So the hammer gets defined, as, and that gets to the, that's the in order to. A hammer, every piece of equipment has an in order to. And that's on um, where? Uh, looks like six, I've got it on 98, so let's go on. Um, Uh, at the bottom, dealings with equipment subordinate themselves to the manifold assignments, there's that use of it, of the in order to. And the in order to is just whatever it is. I hammer in order to drive in nails. So the hammering bears on the nails and it has an in order to, it has something, so to speak, that it's up to, that it's going to do with the nails. And that's... Uh, and the nails, the hammer bears on the nails, and the nail bears on the wood. The hammer is there in order to pound in the nails towards making something fast, as he puts it. That is, making the wood stick to the rest of the wood. That we're all on 69 in the German, and now we're on, we, that was, we're now on 70, 99 in the English. Uh, that's the towards which. So, uh, the, on where are we then? On let me see. On 99, uh, bottom paragraph. The work to be produced as the towards which of such things as the hammer, the plane, the needle, likewise has the kind of being that belongs to equipment, and so forth and so forth. So I'm just collecting these. So you could, I could, I could write on the board with chalk if I had chalk. Uh, so I've. I'll write on the board in order to, and then uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll towards which, what's the phenomena? Well, and then there's the with which. It sounds so hard to get a grip on, but when you just keep your eye on the phenomena, it's a perfect example of what I said at the very beginning of today. You just, all this complicated structure, and then you, there's the in which, can you think of what that is? I, uh, I write with a piece of chalk in order to, uh, well, I, no, I use a piece of chalk, that's the with which, in order to write on the board towards the goal of explaining Heidegger in the classroom. Now, and then there's still the for the sake of which, because why do I do that? Well in order to, uh, for the sake of getting you to understand Heidegger, to, as a, and ultimately for the sake of which, and then uh, the ultimate or the final for the sake of which. That's a long story. The final for the sake of which has got to be the whole point of doing it. My writing on the board, in my final for the sake of which is I'm a teacher. And as a teacher, I do all, all that. And, that. and that's the structure. Now, we go through it a little bit, point, bit by bit. So there's the towards which, and I just read that. And, and then, and what is the, for the sake of which? For the sake, we're going back to the wood. I hammer the, the nail into the wood in order to, uh, I use the hammer in order to, ha ha uh, to, to hammer a nail into the wood toward ma making it fast, then a bigger and a higher, longer toward, toward making a frame, there's a whole bunch of towards, towards making a house. Uh, and then the final question is, and why do I do all that? But that's something to do with being a carpenter. Now, now we have to go through that. So um, we've gone to the building of the house so far. But why is anybody building a house? Well, that's got to do with the point of the activity. That gets translated involvement. And uh, involvement is okay or relevance. The hammer's involved with the nail, and the nail's involved with the wood, and the wood is involved with the frame, and the frame is involved with the house. That sounds sort of funny. 
maybe it's a little better to say the, sna- the, the, the hammer is relevant to the nail and the nail is relevant to attaching the wood and the wood is relevant to making a frame which is relevant to making a house. That's how I would put it to myself. And the house is the primary towards which. That's on page 116 or 84 in the German. Uh, and here it is. Uh, So he's about 10 lines down. With the towards which of serviceability, there is again an involvement with this thing, for instance, which is ready to hand and which accordingly call a hammer. There's an involvement in hammering. With hammering, there's an involvement in making something fast. With making something fast, there's an involvement in protection against bad weather. And this, that's shelter, so you're going to, maybe we should have put shelter in there. So it's, that's the point of it. And this protection is for the sake of providing shelter for Dazan. And that's, that's, pu- that's putting it all together now. But now there's a kind of interesting puzzle that Heidegger isn't, doesn't make as clear as he should, though he's clear about it. Um, so the final towards which, we've still got to say something more about that. Uh, so it's on 116 at the bottom. Now, but, but let me more motivate this. It's going to turn out to be misleading if one thinks that Dasein's final point that makes the whole job of building the house make sense is to make a shelter. Because What's wrong with that? Well, it, it's only not Dasein-y enough. That is, beavers can do that. They do it. They organize their equipment, their mud, and their their logs, and they organize themselves. I don't know how they do it, but they've got a whole system and assign jobs to various beavers. And when it's all done, they have a lodge. And look at that. They've got an, it looks like they've got in order to choose and towards witches, and, and for the sake of witches, they obviously make the lodge for shelter. Something seems to have gone wrong. That, if you really believed that about Dasein, you'd be a sort of sociobiologist. You'd ask sort of what natural thing in the Dasein animal is uh, making it uh, do this thing, which obviously has an important function in keeping it alive and so forth. That's the, obviously the wrong way to think about it if you're going to try to understand the holism of equipment and why it exists at all. And its relevance to Dasein, we haven't quite nailed it yet. Well, he finally nails it at the bottom of 116. In the German, it's, uh, who knows, 84? Yeah. The primary towards which is a for the sake of which, but the for the sake of always pertains to the being of Dasein. Now, everything hinges on getting that sorted out. The its shelter would depend on the being of Dasein in that you might, well, die if you didn't have a shelter. But that, so that can't be, it's not that kind of being. What kind of being does Dasein have? Well, it's the kind of being that takes a stand on its being. So somehow this chain of, this structure chain of the way uh, equipment is holistic and gets its meaning has got to bottom out in the way Dasein takes a stand on its own being. That's the kind of being of Dasein that we want. Well, what would it be? Well, you do this whole job for, say, being a shelterer, or being a carpenter, or being a homemaker. Who knows? I mean, I, but my story, at least, I already told you the answer. I said I you write on the board uh, with chalk in a classroom, in order to get, uh, I take up chalk in a classroom in order to write on the board towards explaining Heidegger for the sake of teaching you or something like that. And what goes in here with the final for the sake of which when I told the story? Being a teacher. Right. And that works perfectly. Uh, And that doesn't mean that everything I do, I had a brilliant student who was worrying about whether when he washed his hands and brushed his teeth, this whole in order to story happened and how it came finally to his being a what. And the answer is, I think, something like, well, whenever, whatever you're doing that's significant gets this 
chain effect. But lots of things you do are just routine and insignificant, and you just do them out of habit or something. Heidegger isn't committed to the view that every time you use equipment, like a toothbrush or soap or water, you've got to go into this whole chain. But when you do anything that's meaningful, significant, you do, you do go into this whole chain. And now I have to give a little speech about being a teacher or whatever. Uh, it could be a, a, a homemaker or whatever. Then what, here Bill Blattner was at his absolute best. I, this is, I, I just said one thing I disagree with him on. Here's something I totally learned from him. It turns out that Heidegger thinks in Division Two, and it's very important, he says that what the final thing here, the ultimate for the sake of which, which is the being that I, the stand I take on my being, using all this stuff to do it, that that final thing is uh, uh, n something that's not, that's in the, a kind of future, but it's not a future that ever arrives. And you wonder what in the world does that mean? And it's very important to Heidegger that the primordial future, the really important future, isn't something that ever becomes present. Now, don't worry about that, but just get the phenomena. The interesting thing that Blattner points out is that you can work toward getting a professorship, uh, that you, getting tenure, let's call it, and then you do all this and you write on the board and you have office hours and you grade papers, and all of toward getting tenure, and it's in the future, and one day you get it, and then it's in the present, and uh, that's and then it's and it stays there unless you lose it for some bad thing, and then it's in the past. But that's not what it's like to be a teacher. Uh, if you get your understanding of who you are by whatever it is, and I'll just stick to mine. I've got to have the phenomenon in front of me. It co it co it coordinates all your activity. You you never arrive at being a teacher. It's always so to speak ahead of you but in a kind of future that is never going to arrive. It but you've got to, co it constantly organizes what you do. And if you're also, uh, if being a father is also something, that, again, you have a baby and you've become a father and it was in the future and okay, there's the baby, now you're a father. But there's another sense of being a father which is a full-time job that you just got for the rest of your life when you got this baby. And that's the kind of thing that Heidegger has in mind as the ultimate for the sake of that connects up with Dasein's being. Now you're ready to understand the punchline in a certain sense. We did get there today. Why is it so important that he makes this, that it comes out this way? Well, to begin with, Dasein has to take a stand on its being its being now turns out to be something like uh, an identity it gives itself using, I think, roles that are around in the society, but like being a teacher or being a shelterer. You can't just probably invent your, this out of nowhere, but, but you take it up as your way of being. But you can't take it up, and now comes, I was just reviewing. Now, but in the next move, you can't take up say, being a teacher, if there isn't a world full of equipment for being a teacher, chairs, classrooms, lights, chalkboards, lecterns, and all that, and if that equipment isn't functioning, I mean, that equipment has to function in order for you to be a teacher. You can't just sit home and say, boy, I am a teacher. I don't like my, I don't go to office hours and I don't like grading papers, but uh, I really think of myself as a teacher. That doesn't work, according to Heidegger. You, you are what you do, he says at one point. And now comes the crucial thing. If you, you are what you do, that means then, among other things, that you have to use all this equipment to be a teacher. And you can't be a teacher without the equipment, and the equipment can't work together in this holistic way of having a point what he's later going to call, I didn't get there quite today, signific a significance uh, without connecting up finally with for the sake of witches. So the, so the equipment gets its significance by connecting up with an ultimate for the sake of which. And the ultimate for the sake of which is possible at all thanks to all that equipment. Well, now the, the punchline, you maybe are, it's dawning on you, What's happened to the distinction between self and world? 
It turns out you can't understand what it is to be a self, namely in this case a teacher or whatever, uh, except by working with all that equipment in the world. And you can't understand the significance of all that equipment, except that all of it, it connects up somewhere, somehow, or at least a lot of it, doesn't matter if all of it, it what's significant in it, connects up with roles that people have taken up in the culture. So he has made his move of, uh, of showing the total way it all functions together. Now let me see, I'm going to skim to see because I went off for a while on my own. Uh, let's look at basic problem 297. So it says, let's see, I will just read it and if it turns out to be what I want, let's hope it's what I want. Uh, it says, world, about two thirds down, world is a determination of Dasein's being. This is expressed from the outset when we say that Dasein exists as being in the world. The world belongs to Dasein's existential constitution. Or world exists only if Dasein exists, only if there is Dasein. And then finally, on now at the bottom of 297, self and world, this is the punchline, belong together in a single entity, Dasein. Self and world are not two beings like subject and object, like I and thou. Self and world are the basic determination of Dasein itself in the unity of the structure of being in the world. So that's pretty good, I think. He's really made uh, uh, an argument there. Um, now, I hope somebody has something to say because I don't want to sort of start saying something else. Uh, good, say something. Yeah, because of this funny fact that Dasein is what it expresses itself as. It goes back to its being is an issue for it. So to express itself, it has to take a stand on what it is to be a father, a teacher, or whatever. And it can do that only by using the equipment for that. And there wouldn't be equipment for that if there weren't people who understood their being that way. I'm just repeating myself, but that's... That's a he helpful. Yes. I understand how he's showing that self and world are two components, but not how he's showing that there's something not that they're interdependent. I see. Well, yeah. I mean, good question. She's not convinced. She she's they're in, she says they're interdependent, but he's sort of gotten rid of the notion of self and world at all. It's really the same as his question. I mean, if 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 you really can't understand self except as it is expressed through equipment, if you can't be a self except when you're coping using the equipment, then you've got the missing link. She's convinced that was simpler than one might have thought. But Heidegger has got a real neat move there. I think it's, it is convincing. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Dave. He doesn't want to necessarily eliminate that distinction between self and world and subject and object. He's going to say that, that it can't be any kind of basic fundamental distinction. It, it can come up later. Good, com but good point. So of Right, you can try to abstract the equipmental whole and, and, and world, and he does when he talks about it, then this gives you the structure of the world. He doesn't have to talk about self. And you can, well, he does, but he could not talk about this. Then he could give you the structure of the world without, then, and sometimes you want to talk about self. I did, I said I'm defining myself as a teacher. But to <laughs> be a self, then you, you, then you have to put this in, then the whole world structure at, at the most basic level, as Dave says, the whole world structure has to be there, and it is. You are what you do, and then it, and so at the most basic level, you can't separate them. But you can in, abstractly by leaving out certain pieces, abstract them. That's that's what I'm saying. Well, so you. Le okay. Well. 
Okay, well, be careful. I mean, scientists mostly study the universe. I didn't make a big deal about it, but when, when you got the distinction between the existentials and the categories, the, I, I did probably say that people, I did, I remember saying it because I talked about uh, Terence Malick at that point. People, people are in the world, and scientists study the universe. However, sci people also study the, the world of the something or others from outside, and, and when they do that, then they're doing social science, and then you can have a theory in which world play shows up. But what you can't, what they can't see is the source of the significance in that world unless they look at it from the point of view of an involved Dasein and so forth. So there are lots of interesting relations between self and world, another possible paper topic. What you can say about it from a theoretical point of view, what kind of abstractions you can make, what kind of abstractions you can't make, those are great questions. Well, thanks for using just exactly the time that's left.